southwest, one of the most colorful sections of our country, has been the home of the Pueblo Indians for over a thousand years. In the old days, the Indians built their homes in canyon walls and on the sides of cliffs, for these were easily defended against warlike neighboring tribes. The land is fertile, but the section is called arid because it so seldom rains. Long ago, the Indians learned that they must water their fields themselves if good crops were to grow. They built rock dams in creeks to direct the water into their canals. Down the ditches, sometimes under the face of a protective cliff, they carried the water to their fields. Simple, yet effective and irrigation took the place of abundant rain. It has been many years since the people lived in cliff dwellings. Modern villages like this one at Laguna are built near the stream which irrigates their fields. The streams also furnish water for domestic needs. A flat rock at the water's edge makes a handy washboard. But there is time for fun and play, for the life of a Pueblo child is a happy one. A mole soap costs 25 cents in a drugstore, but these children know where to get it for nothing. It is simply the root of the yucca plant that grows on the mesa right near their home. Pounding is the only preparation that the mole needs. With a tub of water, the root makes rich suds for beautiful, shiny hair. For many years, Pueblo women have used round adobe ovens for their family baking. Even the smallest children help for the sharing of responsibility is an important part of Indian childhood. The ovens are much like a fireless cooker. A fire is built inside and the whole oven is thoroughly heated. When the proper temperature is reached, the ashes and coals are swept out and the bread is placed inside. The thick walls of the adobe oven retain enough heat to bake the bread in 30 minutes. There is no thermostatic control on this oven, but the gentle oven heat bakes a delicious loaf of bread. White men first came to the Southwest in 1540, but it was not until the railroad was completed 340 years later that there was any great settlement of the section. Towns and cities sprang up, bringing many changes to the old Indian way of life. There were stores with new articles, articles which only cash would buy. Many Pueblo people found that they could turn their ancient crafts into cash. Pottery, once made only for their own use, is built up from a mixture of clay, water, and white powdered rock. The base of the pot is shaped by the hands. A piece of gourd is almost the only tool used. After the base has been made, coils are formed to build up the sides. The rough 
piece of pottery is transformed into a smooth, polished vessel by painting it with a mixture of clay and water, then rubbing the painted portion with a smooth pebble or stone. Beautifully polished, the vessels are ready for firing. Firing hardens the clay and makes the vessels more durable. Cow dung is used for fuel. This enables the skilled potter to control the color of the finished pieces. Cedar bark will help get the fire started. An intense heat is created in these fires, often reaching 1200 to 1500 degrees Fahrenheit. This red ware is darker than that which is generally seen. Weaving, too, had a commercial value, and some of the men who had woven belts only for their families now wove them to sell. Metal and wooden pegs driven into the floor helped the weaver set up his loom. When the loom has been prepared, a brace for the feet and a belt around the waist allow the weaver to vary the tension on the yarn. These products find ready buyers at the Indian market in Santa Fe. In recent years, tourists have flocked to the southwest, and some of the pueblos, like Taos, charge a parking fee for each car. This small charge includes a guide service for all the visitors in the car. One of the most interesting things to be seen in the village is the bow and arrow game, a sport designed to keep the eye sharp for shooting. Tourist fees belong to the community fund, and the money is used to purchase grain. In the spring, when the village food supply is low, all the people gather round, and the governor distributes the grain. There are no orphanages or homes for the aged in a pueblo. Relatives take care of their own. The more dependents a man has, the more grain he receives. In this manner, the whole community helps the people take care of their dependents. Few 
few of us realize the good use which is made of the guide money and camera fees charged by Pueblo. When there is community work to be done, the governor calls out the volunteers. This time, the roof of the church must be repaired. The Indian equivalent of a bucket brigade gets the brakes to the top of the roof. When there's food, everybody eats. And when there is work, everybody works. There are more volunteers than can be used, and it doesn't take long to get the job done. In sharp contrast to the simple life of the Indians is the complex development of cities which have sprung up nearby. There are thousands of new inhabitants in the southwest. Naturally, these people must have food. New fields are necessary to furnish food for these new people, and these too followed the Indians' way of irrigating. Soon, there were many new farms and fields in the midst of the relatively barren range. Fields demanded more and more water for irrigation. Cricks dwindled to a mere trickle. There just wasn't water enough to go around. Corn was their food, and there was no water for it. Pueblo people are represented by their council, and this governing body takes up the serious problem of water shortage. In Washington, John Collier, Commissioner of Indian Affairs, discusses the Indians' problem with them. You can't increase the amount of water in the creeks, but you can use the available water more efficiently. When government funds are available, concrete dams are built to replace the less efficient rock dams. Reservoirs store spring rains until the water is needed in the drier summer months. The flumes which carry the water across the gullies and arroyas were once hollowed out of logs. Many of them leak rather badly. Some of them have been replaced with timber and steel ones from which not a drop of water is lost. Sometimes much water is lost in ditches. Lining a section of the ditch with concrete will save this water. But even with government help, the actual work is still up to the Indian. The school system of the Indian service keeps the small children close to home. From the first grade to the sixth, they attend the Indian equivalent of the Little Red Schoolhouse, built right in their village at home. The murals which decorate the walls, even the studies, are related to real experiences and work in the fields. For the Pueblo children, like their fathers before them, will grow up to be farmers. And, of course, there's a little fun on the side. Everyone needs new clothes. Many of the Pueblo children are too poor to buy these. By chopping wood, helping the janitor, and doing other chores, it is possible to earn some of these clothes. The children are credited with 25 cents an hour for their work, and when a new pair of shoes has been earned, they usually know it. Indian assistants employed at the school keep the record and issue the supplies. A 
Ah, uh -huh, ball game. Batter up. A hit. Now, uh, foul on that one. Hey, that'll be a tight infield play. Safe at second, new shoes and all. These schools do more than merely educate the children. Adults are welcome to use the shop and tools when classes are not in session. Thus, the schools take their place in the Indian community. During the summer months, the boys help in the fields, and they must get out early to feed the horses. It takes the combined efforts of the entire family to make a living from the soil. Complex problems in modern farming are tackled in the boarding schools. closely connected with actual practice in these high schools, and classroom lectures thoroughly prepare the students for experience in the school gardens and the fields. When school is over and the children go home, they face the real problem of making a living and getting their food from the soil. The experience of their elder people, combined with their school work, rounds out their education. Here yeah, now, that's the way it should be done. See? And now let's see you do it. Rough trails and rugged country make the horse mighty important. Small boys have a horse of their own almost as soon as they can ride. Their reward for work in the fields and with the cattle. And now here you see the first four-wheel brakes. Mother Nature leads the way, well, is trying to lead anyway. Cattle increase the Indian's income and furnish him with meat. But the Pueblo Indian is still principally a farmer. A farmer who uses the most modern methods of irrigation and yet still retains a close religious contact with his land. A contact like that expressed in the corn dance a prayer for abundant crops and rain. Crops like these, the corn dancers pray. When fields are green, there is a peaceful home and time for an interesting story when the day is done. Yes, grandfather tells of the days when he was young. 
and young eyes shine with a dream of what the future holds for them.